Welcome back. It's the Big Blue Banter, New York Giants football podcast. I'm Dan Schneier. Joined as always, my co-host Nick Filato, still recording here from sunny West Coast of the United States. The West Coast really is. And I shouldn't say the West Coast because I said that the other night and somebody got was like, well, California's really going to shit and Washington. I was like, I don't want to get involved in any of these conversations. I'm just talking about <laughs> Arizona, Colorado, Nevada. It's really nice out here. And it's sunny, literally pure sun every single day, which affects the mood. So I'm happy. Happy to talk about the Giants schedule, though. You know, it wasn't exactly what I was hoping for with the schedule. I wanted the Giants Jets week one on Monday night. I thought it was a good time to get Aaron Rodgers. There were a few other teams and games that I didn't like. Uh, scheduling wise, they do like that. We have one team early, which we'll talk about, um, which I think will benefit the giants. But overall I was definitely not thrilled to see the schedule. Nick, what was your first reaction? My first reaction was it's a bit difficult. We knew it was going to be that way. The strength of schedule. I think the giants were the third hardest strength of schedule in the NFL. Now that doesn't always carry over. That doesn't always mean that the giants are going to have the hardest schedule. There's a lot of turnover year after year, but if you look at the strength of schedule too, Dan, Number one hardest team is the Philadelphia Eagles. Then it's the Miami Dolphins. Then it's the New York Giants. Then the Patriots, the Cowboys, the Jets, the Bills, and the Commanders. What do all of those teams have in common? <laughs> they're playing each other. The yes, they're, they're all playing, playing each other because I don't know exactly who the AFC East played last year, but the Giants played and the, the Cowboys and the Eagles and Washington. The NFC East played the AFC South. That was a crap division that they just beat the crap out of. The Giants swept that division. So... In order for the Giants to really have a successful year this year, they're going to need to win divisional games. It's something we've been saying since the season ended. They won one last year, and they still went to the playoffs and ended up winning a playoff game. So you can defeat Dallas once. You know, you can defeat maybe Washington twice, and that can increase your odds of going back to the playoffs. But it's not going to be as easy of a road as they had last year. But they did have a bunch of improvements and upgrades on both the offense and defense. So hopefully that will allow the Giants to have some success this season. Yeah, they'll have to be also, Nick, they'll have to be like those 2011, 2007 teams, road warriors, because first first seven of their 11 games are all on the road. Um, they also have, of course, the home game against the Jets, which is like a fake home game, basically. Yeah. I mean, it's not a fake home game, but it's not really a road game much for the Jets. Um, so it's a really interesting schedule from that standpoint. They're going to have to prove it on the road early. Um, we can, we're going to go game by game in a second and just look at those, but a couple other things to just talk about from just the overall thoughts on the, on the schedule. This is from Doug analytics who put, provided some stats for us. And so for me, Nick, when I, when you mentioned strength of schedule a little bit earlier, I think there's two ways to look at strength of schedule. There's the dumb way, as I call it, which is looking at last year's records, which is kind of the most popular way which you'll see on a lot of sites. And now there's the much smarter way that's come to the surface, maybe over the last three or four years. And Warren Sharp is a big uh, proponent of this. And a lot of people have kind of looked at it. It's look at the strength of schedule based on implied total wins by Las Vegas. That's, <laughs> that's the good way to do it. Vegas knows what's going to come. Looking back at last year's wins losses is a very stupid way to look at it. So Implied win total, though, the Giants do have a really tough schedule. This is according to Doug Analytics, who says DraftKings has posted the betting lines for every Giant game. Here's some of the trends. The Giants are favorites in seven total games out of 17. Not great. Uh, in two of the five standalone games, they're favorites versus Seattle at home versus Green Bay at home. In five of the eight home games, they're favorites, but only two of the nine away games, Arizona and Washington. They're only favorites also in three of their first 10 games. So... Um, that's the interesting one right there that when you look at that early slate, those first 10 games, the giants are not expected to win those, uh, to win the majority of those games. So I think it's going to make it really interesting, uh, looking at this thing. I don't think there are any layups in the NFL, Dan, but the only one that you can look at right now on this schedule and say, the Giants should win this football game. If they lose this football game, it's kind of a disaster. And that's week two at Arizona. So out here in Glendale, I'm excited for that game. I might even try to go to that game, Dan. Nice. Other than that. There really isn't a stretch of games where you're like, oh, the Giants could, you know, win three of four here. Last year, we actually had that when the Giants went to Jacksonville and traveled all the way to the Pacific Northwest to play Seattle, had a bye week, and then hosted Houston and Detroit all back to back. Remember that? We were like, the Giants could go three and one there. They went two and two there because they got their asses kicked by the Lions and they lost to Seattle before heading into that bye week. So we don't know exactly what's going to happen, obviously, but this schedule, specifically in the beginning of the season, I think you're going to be able to learn a lot about the Giants. And hopefully they don't suffer from any kind of Kirk Cousins type of illness because the Giants have four of their five primetime games in the first six weeks of the season. Yeah, that's interesting, too. We know that in the past, Daniel Jones has had a poor record on primetime. He's done a little to kind of fix that or get that moving in the right direction at the very least. 
Um, not that I'm putting too much weight in that. I want to look at one more thing before we go game by game, Nick. This is a, a courtesy of Giant Fan and Charlotte. He broke down the Giants' opponents by offensive weapons this year in each week. And one thing that he came to the conclusion on based on this breakdown was that the wide receiver one list is an absolute gauntlet. So let's take a look at some of the receiver ones the Giants are going to face. C.D. Lamb, DeAndre Hopkins, this is in order. Brandon Ayuk, D.K. Metcalf, Tyreek Hill, Stefan Diggs, Terry McLaurin, Garrett Wilson, Devontae Adams, C.D. Lamb again, McLaurin again, Juju, okay, a little bit a bit of a break there, but you could even say um, that's not the easiest thing. Christian Watson, Michael Thomas if he's healthy, A.J. Brown, Cooper Cup, and then A.J. Brown again. That is a crazy slate of wide receiver ones to face. Um, and so, you know, for those who were like, ah, we can wait at corner. We're fine. It's, it's not even that big of a position. Thank God the Giants at least threw a big dart, you know, put a big play into Deontay Banks in the first round. Because if Adoree Jackson isn't healthy, which he hasn't been at any point for a full season with the Giants, or I think yeah, at any point with the Titans either, they're going to put that's going to put a lot of pressure on Deontay Banks potentially. And even in week three against San Francisco, you brought up Brandon Ayuk. You can make an argument that is Debo Samuel. You can make an argument that is George Kittle. And we don't even know who the quarterback is going to be for the San Francisco 49ers. But Banks, he might struggle early on because he's going to get matched up. Offenses are going to try to match him up against their best wide receiver and throw him to the wolves, you know? But this kid, hopefully he has the mental toughness to overcome some of the mistakes. You need to have the mental toughness if you're going to play cornerback successfully in the NFL. For sure. All right, Nick, let's take a look at the schedule game by game. We start here week one. Of course, they did it again. They love doing this game, the NFL. It's their favorite thing to do. It's the but Giants, the Cowboys in prime time because of the ratings, and we get it. It, oh, it never fails for them. It always succeeds for the NFL. Why would they not do this? Um, and this one, this time it's at home. Uh, oh, yeah. First week of the season, Sunday night football against the Cowboys, Nick. And I'm going to say this. There was a big difference, I just think, from a momentum standpoint, from a feel standpoint, of what the Giants' season was last year when they won that first game against the Titans. Yes, part of it is because of how it played out with Dable's ballsy decision to go for two there and then the missed field goal at the end and the Giants win. But looking at this schedule, looking at the opponents they face this year and how much tougher it is than last year, because you mentioned like, oh, looking at strength schedule isn't that good of a way to look at it. Well, the Giants' implied totals last year from Vegas were really low on their schedule, and it played out pretty much exactly as it was supposed to before the season. Giants' schedule was insanely easy, and the Giants surprised and went from a team that was projected to win four or five games to nine. And this year, it's not an easy schedule. So to me, Nick, I look at this Dallas game at home as almost like a must-win playoff game right away. I don't love the fact that they're opening against Dallas for one reason, and it's because Mike McCarthy is going to be the play caller. And I'm not scared of Mike McCarthy, but we haven't seen Mike McCarthy be the play caller in quite a while. So there's not a lot of tape on it. So he's right. going to put the tape out there against the Giants, and then week two, and then week three, and then the team that he plays in week four is going to have the benefit of knowing his tendencies, and then they can exploit those tendencies. So the Giants, are, I don't want to say they're going in blind because we have a long track record of Mike McCarthy as a play caller when he was the head coach in Green Bay. But it's not the same right now. There is no more Kellen Moore. And I was scared of Kellen Moore because Kellen Moore had the Giants number. And the Giants have sucked over the last half decade. So you could take that for what it's worth. A little bit of an unknown with Mike McCarthy. And I wish they kind of had a little bit of tape on how he's actually going to call those regular season games because they don't have anything heading into week one. That's a great call, Nick, because anyone who looks at this is like, ah, it's Mike McCarthy. He's going to run slants, flats from 11 personnel. The same thing every time is wrong. He's not going to run the exact same offense he ran in Green Bay. The personnel is completely different. The quarterback is completely different. Everything is different. And he obviously picked up a lot of what worked in his mind, at least with Kellen Moore. I know he had a different opinion on, on how much worked and how much didn't work with Kellen Moore than we do, maybe. Um, but in his mind, he picked up the good things, quote unquote, from Kellen Moore. So he's going to incorporate that as well. So the Giants are not really going to have any film on the type of offense he's going to call. And that is going to give the Cowboys an edge versus the Giants, you know, from their standpoint, the Cowboys, not they're going to have Dable and Kafka, who they just had a year of film on. And more importantly, they had two games themselves. And we saw how good the Eagles defensive coordinator there did, uh, Gannon, against the Giants in the third game after having two games of tape to look. And I know, look, week 18, it wasn't much tape. But they were still running similar type of offense with Davis Webb, with some boot action, that type of stuff. And it's like, that offense, I think, is what we're going to see to start the season for the most part. I don't think we're going to see a radical change to the Giants' offense. I think they're going to try to work more things in and mix things in. But the first thing they have to do is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I really think that's important with the Giants. Like, keep running your offense until it until it doesn't work. Um, and they're going to have a little bit more data to work with there and more film to work with there, the Cowboys versus us. So they that does give them a bit of an edge, which is which is unfortunate, to say the least. 
hopefully just being at home, that environment, like MetLife Stadium needs to kind of rise to the occasion like it did last year. So the sheer fact that they were competitive allowed Giant fans to enjoy football into November and then into December and then even into January, which none of us really thought was quite possible. I guess we were a little bit higher on the Giants last season, but you're right, man. I mean, week two is going to be easy at that Arizona. It's not a primetime game, but the Giants need to, I, I don't want to say need to win week one. Looking at the schedule that we're about to go over, if you want to make another playoff push, man, like to win your at-home division game against the Dallas right. Cowboys, you need to do that. You need to seize that opportunity. So we're going to learn a lot about this team, maybe even as early as week one. And you don't want the Giants to have to rely on the Eagles not playing their starters again in week 18 and, and this yeah. time the Giants having to win the game. Like you need to if, – if you're expecting that the Cowboys game on the, on the road is a loss or is – potentially or more likely let's say a loss you need to win your cowboys home game the cowboys are not a team in my mind like i'll look at the eagles and i'll say and, and i'm not sure your opinion on this but i'll look at the eagles and i'll say the giants lose two games against the eagles this year fine i can expect that i can assume that it's all right we're not really at that the giants are not really at that level yet um and they can still win those games it's football anything could happen but i don't look at the cowboys the same way i really don't think there's as much of a talent gap with the cowboys versus the giants at this point and especially when you factor in the coaching as well where i think the giants have a clear edge on the offensive side of the ball i don't know about defense i do like the system they run there but on offense i feel like kafka and dave will give the giants an edge over mccarthy and whatever else he's going to use to call i think schottenheimer got hired there again i think shoddy's back the, the shoddy kid shoddy was i mean he got a little better toward the end of his career coordinating but he was at first he was as bad as it gets and he also was a proponent of running a lot on second and 10 which is like the clear sign of a bad coordinator to me um but like i said you got to win these types of games the talent gap is not really there so we'll see what happens there we get into week two this is probably the biggest break the giants got on their schedule there's one more mini break but not a lot of breaks which we'll get into later in my opinion this is the one they got at Arizona, 405 game for those of you who want to watch Red Zone that Sunday. And I will be one of those who is appreciative of the fact that I get a one o'clock slate on Red Zone. Um, this is a good break for the Giants because, as you mentioned, Nick, a little bit earlier, you might have mentioned to me off pod, no Kyler Murray most likely for this game. Maybe he makes a miraculous recovery. Maybe he doesn't. I know some of you are very down on Kyler. I look. I'm more down on them than I've ever been, but I know for a fact if he's on that field, they have a much, much, much better chance of winning. And he's done some crazy things to win games for his teams, like one-off things, where in my opinion, it was really just the quarterback and not much of the team or the coaching that won those games in the past. So I don't want him on the field. I don't think we're going to get him, Nick. I think that's a very good sign. I think that's an excellent sign right there. And this is a game that the Giants must win. And it also starts a two-game road trip where the Giants have – week three, a Thursday night football game. So you have a short week. You travel out Sunday, September 17th to Glendale, Arizona to play the Arizona Cardinals. And then you have to stay on the West Coast to play the San Francisco 49ers in week three. Not to jump ahead too much though, Dan, but then you kind of get a little mini bye week from Thursday all the way to a Monday night football game at home against the Seattle Seahawks. And I know this schedule is not advantageous to the New York Giants, but that is something that I am grateful for. The fact that the Giants do have that little two-game road trip, and I hate that week three matchup against the San Francisco 49ers. I'm scared of that. And I hope it's not a trap game playing the Arizona Cardinals in week two on a short week before going, not returning to New Jersey, and going up to San Francisco to play the 49ers. Like, if that's a trap game, that's terrible. The Giants lose that week two game. It's an absolute disaster because it's the only game on this schedule that I can look at and be like, the Giants should win this football game. And the interesting thing about that is it's an advantage because Kyler won't play Nick, but... It's also a disadvantage because when you play these types of teams like the Cardinals, it's actually better to play them at the end of the season because a lot of times, like we saw with the Colts last year, they'll have given up on the coach. And this is a new coaching staff with Arizona, so that's not as likely. But a lot of these guys – yeah, that guy's not going to work out. But I mean, it's, it's Gannon with the pew, pew, pews. But even so, even when it's not the back end of a coaching change like we saw with the Colts, where – I mean, look, it was a fun game to be at, Nick. The Giants played great, but – it looked like one team wanted to play that game a lot more than the other, in my opinion, watching that Colts Giants game. And you could have got that with the Cardinals later in the year. We have one team, which we might be able to get that with later. Uh, we'll, we'll go over that a little bit later on their schedule, but that's the only negative to the Cardinals early. It's the positive because you don't get Kyler. It's the negative because they still might be it's week two, you know, they're, they're trying to make an upset and sometimes crazy upsets happen there, but you know, we'll see what happens on that front there. Um, and it's at home before the Thursday night game too, which yeah. is kind of like one of those, like it's unwritten. I don't know. I'm not sure. 
yeah, I'm not sure if there's been studies on this, but it does seem like upsets happen, generally speaking, when the team who gets upset has to play on a short week on Thursday and travel. Now, the Giants aren't traveling super far, but they are on a road trip doing it. Right. Yeah. And that's something interesting to think about, too. Is it a look ahead spot where they're going to look up oh, week three? We have the 49ers. Uh, you know, let's not, you know, we may not need to take this as seriously. I don't think the good news is I don't really feel like that's going to be a, a situation at any point under Dable. I think he has this team pretty focused and, and ready to go. I will say this, which I thought was interesting. I read this today, Nick. I'm not sure if you saw this. It was from uh, Peter King's podcast. He said that actually the Giants are the ones who requested to have back-to-back West Coast games. So we're about to get that in week three. It's an, three. It's another West Coast game. Um, and so they wanted to lump. They knew they had three West Coast games on the schedule and on the road this season, which is just unlucky, by the way, uh, and partially because of that Raiders game that they got added. But he wanted to lump uh, – the Giants wanted to lump two of those back-to-back so they didn't have to make three different trips out West. Um, so they uh, NFL then offered the Giants their, their – they they took in their request and they offered them the opportunity to shorten their stay with a third with the, the game coming up in week three here, which we're about to discuss, which is the Thursday night football game at San Francisco. Thursday night football at San Francisco. I'm gonna be scared of that game, man. It's two back to back road games. They're not obviously going to be returning to Jersey. I think you can look at this and see the slight advantage of the fact that they were granted the two back to back games so they could just do the one road trip and then return, even though they have to eventually go back out to play the the Raiders, but I don't know who the 49ers play in week two. They just get to be at home and the Giants second of the back to back all the way out west. It's it's going to be a tough matchup against one of the more formidable teams in the NFC. Yeah, this is a really interesting matchup for the Giants because it gives them a chance on Thursday night football to really make a statement, in my opinion, Nick. Like if the Giants are able to beat the 49ers in San Francisco on a short rest, and we've seen all the studies and the stats that show like the home team has a massive edge on Thursday night football just based on everything, uh, you know, short travel, short week, less rest, which they, they have same rest, but it's just like when you're at home, it's a little bit different. You're rehabbing your own facility, things like that. Um, but if they win this game, that puts a statement that the Giants are, in my opinion, you know, on the map as one of the contenders in the in the NFC because the 49ers, despite their quarterback situation, which is unknown at this time, at least for week three, we don't know what's going to happen in week three in regards to the quarterback. They still have one of the best rosters in the NFL up and down. I mean, you look at their two line, the, the lines there are just absolutely amazing. And now they have Javon Hargrave, who they signed from the Eagles, which was a massive move for them and could put them in the, on the map as having one of the best, if not the best D lines in the NFL, great O line as well, great system, great play caller. But I will say this, people view this game, in my opinion, Nick, as a plus for the Giants to have it in week three, because they're like, oh, Brock Purdy might not be there. This is great. Uh, we don't know about the Brock Purdy situation. It's better to get them early. I view it the opposite, Nick. In my opinion, there's not much to playing quarterback in the Shanahan system. Like, I don't think Brock Purdy did anything that special. And I do 100, and I'm standing by this. I know a lot of people are just giving up on it. I think 100%, I'm 100% positive that after two years of learning the system and getting some reps in, not a lot of reps, but some reps, Trey Lance could operate the system the same, if not better. And I would actually lean toward better than Brock Purdy, better toward Jimmy Garoppolo. Without seeing anything from Lance, understanding he hasn't played in many games, understanding all the rust factor, this system is literally hit your back foot and hit the read. There's a million motion going on before the snap. There's 70 players everyone has to account for. It doesn't require much from the quarterback at any time. And I think it's actually worse for the Giants if Trey Lance is the quarterback for this game. We'll see what happens. Like Sam Darnold could be the quarterback too. I was just about to bring up Sam Darnold. And I'm not sitting here saying, yo, Sam Darnold's there, look out. But Sam Darnold as your third quarterback, if Brock Purdy's elbow is still affecting him, if Trey Lance is not fully recovered, Sam Darnold is a lot better than the options that they had last year if you minus Jimmy Garoppolo because Jimmy Garoppolo was injured a lot. Sam Darnold can operate that system a lot better than I would say some of the quarterbacks of the past. We bring up the CJ Bethards and the Nick right. Mullins of the world. Regardless, we're not really sure who the quarterback's going to be. Either way, I think that's a tough spot for the New York Giants, but it bleeds in to week four where the Giants are home against Seattle, so they don't have to travel back up to the Pacific Northwest. And this is almost like a bye week. And the Giants don't have a bye week until week 13, so any kind of extended rest is going to be welcomed. And this is a Thursday night football game, and then you don't have to play until Monday. That is good for the Giants right there. You know, you get that rest, but it is going to bleed into something that might be a little bit negative that we'll talk about here in a little bit. Yeah, and so we'll talk about that game now. I agree. It's nice to have the mini bye. I wish they kind of had this week six, seven range, Nick six, seven, eight range, yeah. because 
this is actually the first year I've had a little mini conspiracy theory going back years that like the Giants just get their way when it comes to the schedule. I know some people don't agree with that, but like every year I feel like we, the Giants, until this year, the Giants have had a week eight or nine buy, which is like the ideal buy. And it feels like it just kept happening and happening, happening. So I knew at some point they were going to get screwed with a bad buy week. Week 13 is a terrible buy week, in my opinion. It's not. It's like not the worst in the world because it's you kind of look at it like you're gearing up to the playoffs. You give yourself a little buy before the playoffs, but then you have to play another, uh, what, 14, 15, 16, 78. Like you have to play another five weeks. So it really, it, it doesn't really do much for you, but you really want it mid season. But at least, like you said, they kind of get this mini buy. I'll say this it's a home game against the Seahawks on Monday night football. I don't love that spot for the Giants because I feel like Geno Smith coming back to MetLife Stadium is just going to want to have a little bit more, you know, it's just going to be a little bit more motivated for that game. This is the this is the two teams that first, you know, passed on him, the Jets, and then obviously who drafted him and the Giants, two teams that are just like, you're nothing. You're a backup quarterback. You're, you're never going to be anything. And now, obviously, he had this crazy late career resurgence. We'll see if he can keep it up. But the Seahawks are a team that got better this off season. It's not like we're looking at a team that got worse and got, you know, they, you can say they had a fluky run to the playoffs. A lot of people might be saying that and who knows if Geno Smith can keep it up, but this is a team that got a lot better. They got Jackson Smith and Jigba and Devin Witherspoon in out of this draft class. Those are two of the only blue chip talents in my mind that were even in the class alone. And now you're going to put out there for that game. If they're all healthy, DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, Jackson Smith and Jigba. I don't know how the hell the Giants plan to match up with that, but it's going to be a mismatch the entire game. They're going to have to get pressure on Geno Smith early and often and beat up an O-line that's actually pretty good as well. And that doesn't even get into the other side of the board where Devin Witherspoon makes a big difference for them immediately and potentially a guy who you liked a lot in this class who they took in the second round, Derek Hall, who can who can add to you know an edge rushing situation that only improved last year. So this is going to be a really tough matchup. I think the Seahawks are going to be a good team this year. I think the Seahawks are a competitor in the NFC that not a lot of people are talking about because it's not sexy. And the expectations heading into last season was this is going to be the worst team in the NFL. And they exceeded expectations even more than the New York Giants did. This year, if Geno can maintain that level of play, and that's kind of the variable and the X factor to all this, if he can right. maintain that level of play, they're a true competitor for the NFC. Obviously, the Eagles have the edge and then the 49ers, which are in the same division as Seattle. The one thing I don't love about it, yes, you get that little bye week, from week three to week four, but this kind of sucks. You have a short week to travel down to Miami for that week five game because you play on Monday night football. So that's another kind of negative, you know, one of those things where that everything's going to be a little bit truncated for the New York Giants. Everything has to be accelerated. That's a fair point too. I mean, look, it's, it's going to be interesting. And then it leads us to week five on the road for the Giants. Remember seven of the first 10 games are on the road against Miami. This is not a great spot, I don't think, either for the Giants because I was hoping to get Miami later on the schedule because I wanted to potentially have some injuries. At court. This is a weird thing to talk about, but, like, you know. <laughs> I know what you mean. But... I don't want, yeah, I don't want, like, injuries to these players, but, like, who knows what could have been going on with their quarterback situation later in the year. They don't really have – Tyler Thompson. Yeah, exactly. That's the point. They don't really have many options behind Tua. Um, so, instead, they get them early. Uh, this will be an interesting game. Uh, this, this, the, the Miami Dolphins, if you look at their splits last year, Nick, with Tua and without Tua, take a look. With Tua, they were like surprisingly one of the best teams in the NFL. They didn't lose a lot of games, and they had like big time wins, like their uh, win against the Bills. Miami is a scary team. You get them somewhat early. It's not in September, so hopefully it's, I think it's October 9th, if I pull it up right here. It's October 8th. It's going to be a one o'clock game on a Sunday. Hopefully it's not super hot because the one reason why you would want Miami a little bit later that's not injury related is it's not True. going to be blazing hot down there. October, it still could be somewhat hot. And then the next week you have Buffalo. It's not going to be super cold, but you're going up against the Buffalo Bills and that's a primetime game. And you know that the storylines about Brian Dable returning to Buffalo with Josh Allen and all that is going to be a huge hit for the NFL. And the NFL is kind of putting a lot of um, faith in the New York Giants and what they're building, especially early on. I mean, you have five primetime sure. games. You have a Christmas game. So that's basically another primetime game. And four of them are in those first six weeks. That is a lot of New York Giants football early on. The Giants could rise to the occasion. They can flounder. I think they're going to be well-prepared, but these are going to be really hard, competitive, hard-fought games for the Giants to overcome. And I'm looking forward to seeing how Daniel Jones can get this done. Hopefully the Giants can win some games early because it's, uh, like we've said several times with the podcast, not an easy schedule. It's a great point. Four of their first six games are primetime. 
and they're going to have another one later in the year, and they're going to have the Christmas. I mean, they're really expecting an uptick from Dable and and Jones and Shane as far as the offense goes because the Giants weren't an exciting offense really last year. They were more exciting than in years past. They found a way to create some yards, and, you know, some some plays. They didn't score that many points, though, or that many touchdowns on offense uh, or explosive plays. So they're really, like you said, putting faith in the Giants being exciting again. I think it also helps them that, like, the Giants are just the type of team that as long as they're – pretty good like they were last year they're generating ratings for you um as far as tv ratings goes and that's why the nfl is interested there but it leads us to one of the toughest games on the schedule here in week six on the road against the buffalo bills on sunday night football wow that's going to be interesting it's going to be really interesting and i already brought up some of those storylines that are going to be discussed by a lot of national tv and national nfl coverage brian dable returning to the buffalo bills Josh Allen, that's it's tough, man. And now, man, Josh Allen's tweeting, yo, I'm more dialed in than I've ever been. They're going to be on an absolute tear. And they've also improved their roster. Yeah, and it's going to be interesting, too, because they added two. Their, their two premium assets this offseason were spent on the interior offensive line and also at tight end with a player like Dalton Kincaid, who is like a tight end slash receiver slash really difficult matchup. So I'm really interested to see how the Giants play the Bills there. Like, are they going to... Uh, as far as like how Wink Martindale plays them on the other side of the ball, that that that's a whole other story. But on the on the defense side of the ball for the Giants, I'm curious if they're going to play one of those game plans where it's like take the run, we'll give we'll give up the run to you, um, and can the Bills take advantage of that? Because last year that was their biggest issue. Teams were giving them the run, but they weren't blocking well and they weren't running the ball that well at all times. And then they they added Damian Harris too to their right. roster, so right. that is like a that's a hand that's something they have not had. In quite a while, that kind of just hammered like hard. Right. No, like Devin Singletary wasn't that. Zach Moss was supposed to be that. Zach Moss never materialized in that. And they also have James Cook from last year, who I'm sure will be more involved in the offense. Yeah, that's a concern. Or it's like, or do they, the Giants have, they spread out the Giants and how, what kind of, who did the Giants even use to match up against Kincaid? Because by this point of the season, week six, I think we'll be fully immersed in that offense. And it's like, are they going to bring drop down McKinney and use McKinney there? And then how does that impact in the D them in the deeper halves against players like Gabe Davis and, and Stefan Diggs? So it's going to be really interesting to see how the giants match that up defensively. But I think that the giants are going to need to score a lot of points in that game. I would say so. And hopefully the additions of Darren Waller and Paris Campbell, bringing back Saquon Barkley on the franchise tag will actually help the giants throughout this early part of the schedule. And then we have the Washington commanders at home on October 22nd, a one o'clock start against the Washington Commanders, a team that like, look, the Giants kind of own them recently, Dan, but I'm so scared to play this team, even though they have who? Sam Howell as our quarterback right now. I know it's an interdivision game, but that defensive line, we know they have given the New York Giants offensive line, specifically on the interior with Jonathan Allen and Deron Payne, a lot of fits. At least this is a, a home game after that two game road trip. Yeah, the Giants have, in our minds, owned them because I feel like we feel we can we equate that with how the games were actually played versus the finals. But despite quote unquote owning them in the games, which I agree with you on, like the Giants play, outplayed them all these games. They tied a game last year and they lost a game the year before to Washington. So they didn't really like haven't really exactly owned them in the record. And I think this year more than ever, they're going to have to sweep Washington if they want to make the playoffs. And that's just the fact of the matter here, especially if we're saying at best the Giants are going to win one of four. It's not a best, but like because football, anything could happen. But like realistically, if the Giants win one of four games against the Cowboys and the Eagles, which I think is a fair thing to realistically say they should be, you know, they will be doing. They basically need to sweep Washington in my mind and go three and three in the division there. Um, and that's not going to be the easiest test, like you said, not in addition to what you mentioned with their defensive line. I also have a defensive coordinator who, in my opinion, has done a really good job scheming against Daniel Jones and kind of trying to counter what the Giants are doing offensively and 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 take advantage of maybe some of the things the Giants aren't doing offensively in the past game, which we saw and talked about a bunch last season. So it's not going to be an easy matchup. But again, I do really feel uh, strongly in saying they have to win this game and then the next game against Washington. I'd say so. And then that bleeds us into week eight, October 29th, which it's a home game against the New York Jets, which I hate, man. I hate the fact that this is going to be a home game against a team who also yeah. resides in this freaking building. They get the cheapest away game there is. The Giants have benefited from this in the past, but the Jets, bro, with Aaron Rodgers, who's going to be well acquainted with his offense by this point of the season, it's a tough matchup. You know, this is a, a real Snoopy Bowl, right? This isn't the, the crappy preseason Snoopy Bowl. That we that we've become accustomed to seeing, and I'm a little bit uh, afraid of the New York Jets right now with that defense. Yeah, I was really hoping this game was uh, as originally reported in September 11th. Mm -hmm. I just feel like 
you want to get the Jets early, not late or mid, because you want to get them before Aaron Rodgers has any time to build a rapport with Garrett Wilson, any time to build a rapport with Brees Hall, any time to really get himself feeling like this is his team and, and he feels comfortable with them. Instead, they get a midseason. At this point, I feel like Aaron Rodgers will be ingratiated with this offense and with his teammates. So it's going to be a really difficult game for the Giants. But the Giants did beat Aaron Rodgers last year. Unfortunately for the uh, – not unfortunately, reality is that that Packers team is – considerably worse last year than the Jets team. A lot of that was coordinator based, but that's a big part of the NFL coaching. And that defense was insanely poorly coached in that in the Giants win against the Packers. And it led to that 90 yard touchdown drive by the, by the Giants. It led to those deep crossers being wide open and stupid communication breakdowns by the Packers secondary. None of that is happening against Robert Salah. That's the problem. Robert Salah is one of the best coordinators in the NFL, and he has a lot of talent to work with on that defense. So none of those things are going to happen. So the Giants are going to have to find a way to generate enough points because you know Aaron Rodgers is going to put up some kind of production against the Giants on the scoreboard. Yeah, it's it's a tough situation for the Giants right there. It was at week eight. And yes. then you start your three-game road trip, which sucks. Week nine through week 11 you have to go back out to the west coast for las vegas and that is a just sunday game 225 my time so i'm guessing it's going to be 425 east coast time and then you have the dallas cowboys and then washington so you have two of your nfc east rivals back to back on the road i'm wondering if the giants stay out west because dallas is pretty west out here it's not west coast but it's out west so I think that's going to be a uh, a point of the season, hopefully, where it's like if you steal one or two of those games, it's going to significantly help your chance of going to the playoffs. I hope that's how we're looking at it, right? Where that's like the defining point of the season where it's like we have a three-game road trip, which does not happen that often in the NFL. You need to beat the Raiders and you need to split and either beat Washington or beat Dallas on the road. Yeah, that's a good way to look at this three-game stretch, Nick. And, and we're going to have to see what happens with the Raiders starting this off because they have Jimmy Garoppolo in at quarterback right now. They didn't really draft behind him, so we're not exactly sure. I'm assuming he'll be there all season. Uh, as I think the they got the kid from Purdue, didn't they? They did get O'Connell, who I know you like a lot, but I, don't, I, don't, I doubt we'll see him this year. We don't know, though. Um, so that's, I feel like, is as close to a must-win game as the one you mentioned earlier against the Cardinals. Again, this Raiders team is actually not that bad. And they have a pretty decent roster, and they added Tyree Wilson to a pretty damn good uh, defensive line there. But it's definitely a team where if the Giants are making the playoffs, they're they're winning this game. And then obviously Dallas on the road, tough. But remember that Dallas game the Giants played on the road last year. If that Isaiah Hodgins touchdown doesn't get called back, and you look at it after the fact, and people who played offensive line, the people who played in the NFL said this was a bad call, that the refs just missed this one. This is one that never gets called. It's a totally different game, and the Giants were so shorthanded coming into that game. What's his name was playing guard? Uh, the kid who missed the screen block for, for Saquon. Jack West. Anderson. Jack yeah. Anderson. Uh, and so they, they were really thin. Or Dory was out. Like they were insanely thin injury wise for that game. I remember that was the thinnest they were all year against the Cowboys in Dallas and still put up a decent game there. So I think this is a little bit more winnable than, than some of these other road games. And obviously, as you mentioned, that third closeout on the on the on the um, the three game road streak is Washington. Another game that, again, as I mentioned earlier, the Giants have to win both Washington games, in my opinion. I think so, too. I think you have to at least split the Dallas and Washington games that are back to back. So, I mean, look, look at the schedule though, leading up to me, San Francisco, Seattle, Miami, Buffalo, Washington, New York jets. Like those are some tough matchups right there. You need to, you need to win these division games. I think that's what it's going to come down to. The giants can make the playoffs again. We can see what happens, but they need to win more than just one freaking division. Game. The fact that they won one division game and somehow still made the playoffs and then beat the Vikings in the playoffs. That does not happen a lot. Like those combinations, when you fail sure. in your division as drastically as the Giants did in 2022, you typically do not end up going to the playoffs. They were just benefiting from the fact that the NFC sucked so bad that they ended up making the playoffs as a third seed in their own division. Yeah, they benefited from that, and they benefited from playing the AFC South, which you don't get to do every year. You don't get the Titans, Jags, Texans, and who's the, the fourth team in there? And who? The Colts. The Colts. Like, this is like... That, that was such a bad decision, the division the Giants faced last year. The worst in the NFL. I think the Jaguars made it at seven and with seven wins or eight wins to the playoffs there, eight and nine maybe. So that was a huge benefit. And what happened? The Giants swept the division. So, again, that's just not something you're going to get this year. And so because of that, you probably need to add two more wins from the division, I would say, with the idea that maybe you steal a game against Miami and the Jets. And so you split against the AFC East, lose – or, you, you know, maybe it's – Jets, 
Jets Patriots or, or Dolphins Patriots that you win. But either way, you split those two games and you add two more wins in the division to kind of even that whole thing out there would be what a kind of long lines I'm thinking. That brings us to our next game here in week 12. Uh, this one is also at home after a three-game road streak, and that's the Patriots. Um, so we'll see what happens here. I think a lot of people are writing off the Patriots, Nick, and I think we could see – now, I don't think it's definite that it's going to happen, but we could see a Dable Kafka-esque type impact on that entire offense, bringing in Bill O'Brien, who is not a great general – a horrific general manager slash coach. <laughs> wasn't was an okay head coach, pretty good head coach above average but as an offensive coordinator straight up i think he's going to be a good coordinator i think more importantly he's going to be a really good voice for the quarterback there um and for the entire offense there so it could be a people are sleeping on this team but they could have one of the biggest jumps uh like the giants had from 2021 to 22 just in the pure sense of the coaching makes this a difference that's this large because you're talking about a team that was as poorly coached on offense as any team in the nfl last year some would make the case it was the most poorly coached offense in the nfl and now you're going to uh you know top 10 top 12 potentially there exactly bill o'brien is such a better offensive coach than matt patricia and joe judge i don't know what bill belichick was doing that was hubris that was on bill belichick and i'm smarter than everybody and it turns out that no you're not in this case you can't put defensive coaches and people who are football guys in charge of this offense we saw it just flounder they had no passing attack whatsoever and yet still they dropped mac jones i think threw for over 400 yards against ed donatel at the minnesota vikings so let's yeah. keep that in the context a little bit here i think it's important but um yeah they're gonna improve and then I'm a little like, again, the AFC East to me, there's no easy win there or even like a win where, where it's like, you know what, I'm just going to easily say that they're going to win this game. They might not, but I'm easily feel comfortable enough to say, yeah, last year we had a bunch of those on the schedule. We had basically the entire AFC South. We had teams like Seattle who beat the crap out of the Giants. We had teams like Detroit who beat the crap out of the Giants. So we were like, these should be easy wins. It goes to show you that, you know, what we think now doesn't really, really mean much, but at the same time, you look at this schedule with the NFC West. You have the Cardinals. We don't really know what the Rams are going to be. We have the Cardinals and the Rams, but Seattle and San Francisco are both two scary teams. And then the Giants also play, what, Green Bay, New Orleans, and the Raiders. But the New Orleans game is in New Orleans, which the Giants historically play like crap when they're down there in New Orleans. And then Green Bay is at home. I would hope that's a winnable game, but we'll have to wait and see. But in terms of the Patriots, you go right into a bye week after that. So it's not an easy matchup, but you go right into a bye week and then you stay at home against the Green Bay Packers coming out of the bye week in week 14. And then the Giants from there on out only have one trip where they're traveling away from basically the Northeast. And that's when they go down to New Orleans. And we'll get to that in a little bit. Yeah. And that first game out of the bye week, Monday night against the Packers. It's another one I was hoping would be early. The Packers was another match, but I was hoping it would be a little bit earlier in the schedule. Jordan Love, not that many reps. Um, so mm. I was hoping to get him earlier when he doesn't have time. I also feel like, especially with the way the Packers drafted and crafted their roster moving forward, the re, you know, they drafted the two premium picks a position that typically takes longer than any other position besides quarterback to really get going in the NFL, maybe besides offensive line too, at tight end, like tight end is one of the longest developing positions, but now you have here, instead of maybe getting them week two, week three, week four, week five, you get them week 14. And they've now had 13 weeks to kind of get that offense up to speed, get those tight ends up to speed. And if they have it going the way they want it, they want to be a 12 heavy offense with those two tight ends. And if they get that going, it's going to be present some really difficult matchups for Wink Martindale and the Giants. It's going to present some really difficult spots just because he hasn't seen a lot of those types of offenses on film at that point. So it's like a big adjustment. So this is a very winnable game, in my opinion, against the Packers. But I, I was hoping to get a little earlier on the schedule. Yeah, it still remains a little bit unknown just because we don't really know what Jordan Love is going to do. But I, I'm there with you. I think just looking at it now in May, you say, yeah, the Giants should win this football game if they're the same team or even take another step from what they were last season. But this bleeds into a two-game road trip, Sunday night or Sunday morning, I'm sorry, at New Orleans, and then a Monday night game on Christmas or just a Monday game on Christmas against the Philadelphia Eagles. And one interesting note, too, about this, Dan, the mm -hmm. Giants, before the bye week, get both of their Washington games and both of their Dallas games out of the way. So they're not going to have that like week to, hey, let's go over like a pro scouting report on what the hell the Washington Commanders and the Dallas Cowboys are doing. So they don't really have that benefit. They have to prepare for each game heading sure. in. They don't have that bye week. The only team that they play after the bye week is the Philadelphia Eagles, and they play them twice. Hopefully the Eagles are sitting all their guys in week 18 like last year, but we can't really rely on that. No, you can't rely on that. The Eagles tw twice in three weeks, assuming that's not the case because 
you know, it could happen, but it's not a guarantee by any means, especially nowadays where there's only one bye week in the NFC or in, in football in either conference. So it's like you you might it, it's much harder to be in the position that the Eagles were last offseason now with the rules of only one seed that gets the bye versus in the past when there were two seeds. A lot of times it'd be like, eh, I'll get the one or the two, but either way, I'm getting the bye. Um, so we don't know about that, but yeah, this is an interesting stretch here because you get the Rams in week 17, which is, this is one of the, I said earlier, my favorite break on the schedule was the Cardinals. This is probably either my favorite or second favorite break with the Rams because week 17 Rams could be, if Matt Stafford doesn't stay healthy, just a pure easy win for the Giants. If he's out, that team is definitely going to have given up at that point. We're probably going to see reports about Sean McVay not going to retire at that point. So we're really like sending off that staff and everything. So this is probably my favorite, actually, I, honestly, over our, this might be my favorite game on the schedule, luck wise for the Giants and favorable could, wise for the Giants over Arizona. It could easily be the Colts situation all over again. Yeah. As long as Baker Mayfield isn't cut by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and then goes and plays for Sean McVay, I think the Giants will be okay. Yeah, but if Stafford plays, it's not an easy win, I don't think. But no, Stafford's too good for an easy back. win. Yeah, but if he's not playing or if he's playing, but the rest of the team's kind of given up and the offense just looks stagnant like it did last year, this could definitely be an easy win. But the two before it, Saints and Eagles are not going to be. Christmas game against the Eagles will be interesting, though. The Giants will have a lot of opportunity there to show the world at that point of the season like they are a true contender. They have two games. I think they have the early game against the Bills that really shows it and the Niners, those two games. And they have this game late against the Eagles if, the thing, if things are going the way they want um, to really prove that which can easily get flexed into a primetime game if this is a very important matchup and the Giants end up winning a lot of games throughout the season. So that would mean the Giants have six, kind of seven primetime games if you include the Christmas game against the Eagles, which was a couple weeks earlier. If the Giants can find out a way to win on Christmas, what a Christmas gift that would be for New York Giant Nation. Like I would love for the Giants to actually get these wins against teams like Dallas and Philadelphia. And if the Giants just rise to the occasions twice against in those four matchups they can find ways to steal two games out of those matchups split those split those series against the dallas cowboys and the philadelphia eagles dan like i'm feeling great at that point even though their schedule is very very difficult yeah exactly you nailed it and we'll see what happens in those games all right nick let's let's do some final thoughts on the schedule anything that comes to mind or anything else that you didn't get a chance to get out there I kind of brought this up a little bit before, just how the Giants are leaving the Northeast once after their bye week. And even before that, if you want to include all the way to week 11 for Washington, if you consider that the Northeast, but there's only one game that's basically going to be a fair weather game. And that's the one that's in a dome down in New Orleans. I mean, you could have good weather in late November and December. We had some last year for the New York Giants. But at the same time, it could be crappy weather. It could be cold. So I think that's one thing that we can maybe factor in. I think Daniel Jones, I would say he has played better recently with the better coaching in the cold weather. But I remember earlier throughout his career, you and I, we had some questions about Daniel Jones' ability to throw through the wind in those in those early games against the Philadelphia Eagles in those early games in December when he was playing. I feel like he dispelled that a little bit last year, but it's still something to note. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm going to finish off here with a few other things I just had in my notes when I was looking at the schedule. Uh, I didn't get a chance to go over yet. So the week four game against uh, on Monday Night Football against the, the Seahawks, you talked about how it's like a mini buy for the Giants. They have a three-day rest advantage. The Seahawks will be playing on eight days rest after coming off Sunday. So that's, not, that's an interesting note for the Giants. In week six against the Bills, I don't think we mentioned this earlier, but it's something that could give the Giants advantage as well. The Bills are playing the week before in Europe. So, yes, both teams have the same seven-day rest there, but one team is coming from Europe, the Bills, against the Giants, who are not, which that could give them an actual advantage if Jet, definitely if does. jet lag and things like that um, being a major factor there. Um, and then finally, something else I forgot to mention is that Week 14 home game against the Packers, which is also Monday Night Football, that's the fit. The Giants will have basically like – they'll have the – it's like almost like an extended buy. It's going to be 15 days playing uh from the giants previous game to that game and the, and the packers will be coming off eight uh eight days of rest and then on the flip side of all that the jets in that that game against the jets in week eight they're actually coming off their bye so we didn't mention that earlier but the jets will be coming off their bye same thing with the week 12 game against the patriots the patriots are coming off their bye so the giants are facing two teams coming off their bye there so that can make those games potentially a little bit more difficult as well 
yeah, you hate playing teams coming off the bye. And I feel like every year, the I mean, every every team does. Like yeah. We complain about it, but every team has to complain about this. And this schedule is very difficult because of the opponents on it. Some of these road trips do suck. I think there are some positives that you can look into the schedule. Overall, it's probably more negative, but I also don't believe that Roger Goodell and the schedulers are out there saying, screw the Giants. Like that's They yeah. aw- rewarded the Giants with the back-to-back West Coast trip from Arizona to San Francisco early on. And then that basically bleeds into a mini bye week, which I do feel is an advantage for New York early in the season. For sure. All right. Thanks again to everybody listening to the Big Blue Banter podcast. We will be with you again next week and talk some more Giants football with you. Otherwise, have a great rest of your weekend and we'll talk to you soon.